Oh, Stephanie's here. Okay, they are piling in. So let me just get our screen up here and then we'll do some intro stuff and we'll get started in just one moment. So we'll let everybody kind of get logged in and get situated and then we'll be good to go. So welcome everybody. I'm gonna do some introductory comments here and then we're going to start our program for this evening. Um, Marty, you'll want to change your name because you're also Ethan at the moment. So do the little three dots and change your name. Um, welcome to the HCMA's Big Hearted Warrior Tour. Uh, this is a special stop at Tufts Medical Center where tonight we're going to be discussing um, some late breaking information that came out of the summit, which took place earlier this month. If you are watching us on Facebook, you can watch, but you can't participate in questions. You will have to join the Zoom room to do so. You can use the link that is in the event, or you can go to 4hcm.org and register and join us at any time throughout the evening. Throughout this evening, we're going to be discussing a number of topics related to HCMAs, uh, some of our projects that we're working on, as well as the information that is in the agenda regarding the late breaking information from the summit. Tonight, we are joined by three physicians who will be taking the time to share information with us, and you will have the opportunity to use the question and answer uh, feature at the bottom of your uh, Zoom tab. The questions may be answered in writing by the speakers or by myself uh, or a member of the HCMA staff, or we can wait until the session is concluded and there'll be a Q&A at the very end of the session. For a period of time, we will have a Q&A at the end of the session that will stream on Facebook, but at the very, very end of the session, we will stop streaming on Facebook. We will turn off the record feature uh, from the program and you can ask a question either in the chat box or you will be able to raise your hand and you will be able to ask a question at that point. I am going to launch a poll right now and that is for you to take time while I am giving my talk to um, pretty much answer so we know where everybody's coming from so <clears throat> everybody can jump in and participate in that. We did get a little bit of a late start this afternoon. Uh, we're sorry about that, but we still have a lot of people joining us. So don't panic if you think you're gonna miss anything because you can always go back and rewatch it later. Um, this will live on our YouTube channel come tomorrow and it will also live on the HCMA website in the next couple of weeks. So don't panic if you're missing anything. Please do take the time to take the survey. Um, I'm gonna take one minute to introduce two members of the HCMA team who are here with us tonight. We have Amy Mann, who is our meeting coordinator. Amy, say hi. Hi, everyone. And we have Julie Russo, who is our volunteer coordinator. And she might be working with some of you in the future on different projects. So just we have two of our staff members here. Hi, and this, thank you, Julie. And at this point, I'm going to hand it over to, well, Marty just disappeared and he's still Ethan. Um, so I'm going to hand it over to the team from Tufts where we can do some quick introductions and then I will be taking the podium back and we will be starting my talk. So um, Ethan, I'm going to promote you to Marty right now because Marty's not on screen and he's still Ethan. Um, so I'm gonna, I'm gonna rename him, I think. I'm gonna rename him because he's not renaming himself. So Ethan, you wanna tell us who's on your team here tonight? Great, thanks Lisa for having us. Um, I'm Ethan Rowan, I'm the co-director of the HCM Center here. Um, uh, with us giving talks today is Mike Robich, who's the surgical director of the HCM Center. And then director um, is, is Marty Marin, um, who's gonna be rounding out the talks, talking about sudden death or stratification. And he's back. <clears throat> okay, so Marty, you wanna say hi? Hi. Um, hi, I just want to say thanks again for um, putting this together. Um, and uh, it's a globe. So we are going to be kind of summarizing some of the highlights of the, of the summit. 
There was a lot of information at the summit. Can't um, <clears throat> cover it all, but I think we're gonna try our best to highlight a couple of the key different areas for everybody. We've tried to make it as simple and clear as we could, um, but certainly we can address anybody's concerns in terms of questions. So um, that's our goal today is to try to summarize some of the key points that were brought out over a three, a three day summit. So Marty, I'm going to give you a little bit of a reprieve because I know you ran from the clinic and you ran home and your son is desperately wanting some daddy attention. So I'm going to take the mic back and give you a few minutes to spend with your family. And we, we know that, you know, when we do these meetings, we're doing them at night after long days. And if people are back at home and they're not in the clinic, we know everybody has a lot of demands on them. So we really thank you for your time. And I'm sure everybody can understand little kids need a little dad time and mom time when they come home. So um, that being said, I'm going to jump back. Hold on one second, I gotta present again. Um, resume slideshow, there we go. And then I'm going to do my screen share. No matter how many times we do this, we don't get, it's never completely smooth. So I'm gonna tell you a little bit about tonight uh, again, and then we're going to also go over some of the things that the HCMA discussed at the summit. Um, and we, we had three hours of programming, which was affectionately called Lisa's three hour extravaganza. So to those patient stories that we featured in the three hours, thank you for sharing your stories with us. It made for a very um, impassioned night. You know, it wasn't just data, data, data. We brought your stories to, to the forefront. So thank you for all of those who shared your stories. Um, so tonight I'm gonna kind of give an overview of some of the things we discussed at the summit. Uh, we're gonna talk about surgical treatments of heart failure. We're gonna talk about AFib, uh, pulmonary hypertension and some non-obstructive HCM stuff. And then we're going to talk about imaging and sudden death prevention, and then there'll be some Q&A. So that is our cool agenda for tonight. And I do want to start out by saying October, which we're rounding out right now, is Sudden Cardiac Arrest Awareness Month. And many of the families that are viewing tonight have been touched by sudden cardiac arrest related to HCM, and I am one of those. Two of my family members died from sudden cardiac arrest, my grandfather in 1953, and my sister in 1995. So as we conclude Sudden Cardiac Arrest Awareness Month, I wanna take a moment to remember those that we lost and to promise them and to all those who love them that we continue the battle to beat HCM whenever possible. We're not perfect. Unfortunately, sudden cardiac arrest is still a part of this disease process. And we just wanna take a moment and acknowledge those who have passed and those who have survived cardiac arrest. So that's just my way of rounding out SCA month. So I wanna talk a little bit about new projects of the HCMA. And you guys are the first ones outside of the summit seeing some of these slides. So I am really happy. All right, I'm outright excited to bring you a new program. And this program is called HCM Academy which I like the acronym because it's HCMA, works for me. There's gonna be a bit of that tonight. So what is HCM Academy? Well, if you've ever heard me talk about the importance of HCM education, we have our center of excellence programs around the country. We also have a lot of cardiologists out there that don't know much about HCM because you just don't see it very often. So we've created in partnership with PCM Scientific Scientifica CME and the HCMA and amazing partners, this academy project. So the faculty is myself, Marty Marin, Anjali Owens, and John Lynn Jeffries. We are the national faculty working with this medical education firm. firm. Um, okay. Um, and we're going to tell you a little bit about what this program actually is. So here's the slide explaining what HCM Academy is. There will be online digital content. There are six online CME educational modules. There will be five online CME case studies and five online non-CME patient perspective videos. And we thank the five patients of the HCMA's uh, Share Your Story program who had this video taping done and they did a phenomenal job of explaining their life with HCM. People, or physicians who are attending these workshops, so these are CME credits, these are medical education, they're then going to be um, 
encouraged to take additional courses. And there's an online workshop module that will be live where there will be a, a educator who has been chosen based on regions. We are starting with three regions of the United States. Once we get that up and running, hopefully we'll get funding to do the rest of the country. Anybody can sign up for any program, but we're trying to keep them within the region so that we start to develop relationships that way. And there's going to be a brand new website. It's going to launch next week called thehcmacademy.com. And you're going to be able to access that directly through the HCMAs page. And additionally, uh, oh, I'm getting ahead of myself. I want to tell you that the financial support for this program came from BMS, Sanofi, and Cytokinetics. They did not have anything to do with the actual curriculum that was done by the uh, faculty and the staff at PCM Scientific, who are professional medical educators. And they, um, we just want to raise awareness about HCM. So how can you help to improve HCM care? You can refer your own doctors to HCM Academy. So I have a screenshot here of the HCMA website. And if you hover over programs, you will see HCM Academy right here. And after, where'd it go? There it goes. After you click on that, you'll have an opportunity to click this button right here to refer your provider. If you are a provider and you're watching this, you can just click here and that's a different pathway. If you're referring your provider, you'll have an opportunity to check a button that says, let them know I'm the one that recommended him or her. And that will give us an opportunity to send an email. Hopefully you've got the email addresses. If it's only by paper, we'll do that too. And we can mail it through the mail. Um, but you can say, yes, you can tell Dr. Smith that I am the patient and I'm referring him to HCM Academy. And that way you can follow up with your doctor and say, oh, did you participate in HCM Academy or not? And our goal here is to bring HCM awareness to GPs, family practice docs, cardiologists in the community, pediatricians. We want a more robust understanding of HCM, and this is an amazing program. A lot of people have put a lot of hours into collecting this information and putting this together. And Amy, who you just met, um, will now be working not only as our meeting coordinator, but our HCM Academy coordinator, working behind the scenes with our faculty here. So we're really excited to bring this program out. It's at a whole different level than anything we've ever done before. And we think that it's going to make a significant difference in the lives of those with HCM seeking care at all levels. So the legislative advocacy stuff. So we had a little technical problem with the website today for our you join, but I will explain that in a second. So we are working on a program called the Healthy Cardiac Monitoring Act. Can anybody look at that acronym and say, where'd you come up with that? So the Healthy Cardiac Monitoring Act or the HCM Act is not only about HCM. It is about including the same questions that we ask of student athletes in every well child examination. That means when a child age one to 19 goes into their doctor for a well child exam, certain cardiac questions should be asked. Believe it or not, the only state in the United States that asks cardiac questions in a well child exam is the state of New Jersey. And we started doing that in 2015. I originally had intended to move this initiative forward in 2016, but I tried to die and needed a heart transplant. So I was a little delayed. So excuse me for being a little delayed in getting this to you, but it's ready now. In a couple of days, we're going to be launching an online system where all you need to do is go visit that page and click, and it's gonna take you to a page from a company called UJOIN. You will put in your name and address and a story. You can write a narrative or you can take a short video of yourself and send it to your state level legislators. So we're looking at assembly, Senate, whatever your state calls your local level uh, officials. We have state-based um, data that we're gonna send them to tell them how many people are potentially affected by diseases that of the heart that are genetic in nature or acquired. Uh, it's looking at HCM, long QT syndrome, Brugada syndrome, ARVC, dilated cardiomyopathy, Marfan syndrome. It's not just for HCM. We have a lot of amazing partners on this project, but probably the most important, 
because no heart related legislation moves in this country without the blessing of the American Heart Association who has vetted this language and is supportive of our initiative. We are working with some other organizations to formally get their approval as well. One of which I'm waiting on is the American Academy of Pediatrics who earlier this year, about two months ago, issued a paper calling on America to do better at looking at their children's hearts. So we're, we're being vetted right now there. If we get them on board with us, it's gonna be an easy sale. But AHA is definitely on our team on this one. So it's gonna be live in two weeks. I'm very excited to get this out there. Imagine how many lives we can save and change if we have the opportunity to, not, no, 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 no. <laughs> Um, sorry, husband's dropping off dinner and it almost fell on the floor. Um, so we have the opportunity to get in front of a lot of families. Yes, we're looking for children with signs and symptoms, but we're also looking for the parents as well. And we'll have the opportunity to do that with this initiative. Um, we are doing some recruitment here at the HCMA and you can go right online to, uh, Julie, if you would be so kind as to put the, the link to the volunteer page in the chat box, please you can sign up to be a member of one of our committees. Our committees have a one-year commitment. So we're gonna be adding some new members to the committees effective January. We are looking for five new members of our legislative subcommittee or legislative committee and six new members to our patient education committee. To learn more about them, you can sign up as a volunteer. We'll be asking some questions. We need some good mix of experiences, diversity, um, points of view, some of these committees um, are going to be more patient heavy, others will be more scientific heavy, but everybody has a seat at the table and a voice to be shared. So we're looking forward to that. <clears throat> Those are existing committees. We're slowly bringing on some new committees, including health equity and medical affairs. These are going to be new effective January and to apply, you'll submit through the um, portal that Julie's uh, putting up online right now. And we will be looking at resumes and asking questions. There will be an interview process to ensure we have the right mix of experiences and points of view. Uh, it's really important to us that everybody's at the table for these conversations and that we are having um, an opportunity for everybody to share their thoughts. If you apply and you do not get in this year, it doesn't mean that we don't want or need you or appreciate your uh, offer. We're just trying to set up the right group of people in each of these committees. So if you're not in this year, it might be for next year. So please keep an eye on that. <clears throat> Just want to take a moment to, to talk a little bit about our Center of Excellence programming. As of right, oh, sorry, this slide is not up to date. As of October 2021, we're at 43 programs. And starting on Monday, we have a brand new Center of Excellence coordinator. Stacy Titus will be joining the HCMA team in the capacity of COE coordinator. And we have a number of programs that are in the pipeline and between 2020 and the retirement of Valerie, we are a little bit behind there. So we're gonna be catching up on some of those program evaluations. Um, if you're watching us on Facebook, you know what these um, programs mean and you're, you're watching us there. If you're not following us on Facebook, this is the HCMA main page. These are official groups of the HCMA. And as you can see, they're growing. So we have the Parents Network, we have the General Communication Room, we have our partners in Sweden, and now we have our partners in, um, in um, the Netherlands. And we are hoping that we're going to be building a more global HCM community, not only in patient advocacy, but in treatment as well. So we have this new program called HCMAI, which is HCM International, and we are looking to expand our reach pretty much everywhere that there are human beings on the planet, because where there are human beings, there is HCM. Okay, um, if you have not already participated in an online discussion group, I certainly encourage you to do so. There are wonderful people who are trained advocates and trained discussion group leaders who are there to help communicate with you, help you understand concepts, find some support. I run a couple of groups a month. I do the transplant pathway and the premyectomy group. We're going to be bringing in some other people to run the premyectomy group coming up in the future. And I, I also do the newly diagnosed or new to the HCMA group. So uh, it kind of helps us hit the masses with a lot of data really quickly so you can learn a lot about us in an hour. Um, 
Tales from the Heart is our podcast, which we have two monthly co-hosts, Dr. Marty Marin, who you're going to be hearing from later, and Dr. Harry Lever. And we are now going to be moving into special guests every month and special topics every month. So we're going to have a quarterly special from a, a gentleman who is an HCM patient who's had a myectomy and now is going to be an HCM cardiologist. So unique perspective, and I think it's going to be fun quarterly checking in with him and seeing what's going on in his world. And we're going to have more patient stories coming to you as well. And in December, we're going to be bringing a very special roundtable together to kind of talk about that issue I brought up earlier, health equity. We're going to have a panel of all uh, Black individuals and African-American individuals who are going to talk about their experience because we know there's not enough Black, Latino, and Asians diagnosed with HCM in the United States. We know it's mostly Caucasian diagnosis at this point, and we need to start making some bold moves to wake up other communities to say, hey, it's, it's a disease for all of us, and we need to make sure everybody's getting to care. So we're going to be doing that soon. If you've not already taken advantage of the Invite genetic testing program, I encourage you to do so. You need your physician to order the test, but it is a free test for you and any member of your family. So you can get free genetic testing. You know, I laugh because many years ago, we beat them up on pricing the genetic testing industry. We started at $8,000 for a panel that looked for basically five genes. And now we have free genetic testing for very large panels with very informative results for families who need that. So um, we are hoping that you take advantage of that. And I screwed up the last slide too because I had a slide issue. So we thank our partners at Tufts, not Morristown. We also thank Morristown, but our partners at Tufts, are all of our Center of Excellence partners, our staff, our board, our volunteers, and Brandy, my donor for without, with, without whom I would not be with you tonight. So I'm going to stop there and I'm going to pivot back to, okay, Marty became Ethan again or Marty disappeared. I don't know where Marty went. <laughs> so Ethan is, I believe, up next or is it Mike up next? Let's see who's up next. Mike, you're up next. So I don't know. I think Bodhi took Marty away from us for a while. So uh, hopefully he'll come back on in. Uh, I will follow up with him on the cell phone in a minute. Um, and if you want to do your slide share and you can start your presentation. Okay. Thank you. All right, one second here and I'll get this figured out. Let's see, thank you so much, Lisa. Uh, da, da, da. Happy to have you here. Got it, all right. How's that? Is that working? Perfect. Wonderful. Stay thank you, thank you so much for having me this evening. I really appreciate it. Your, your efforts and your tireless work is, is really amazing. Um, and I appreciate it. Uh, my name is Michael Robish. I'm an adult cardiac surgeon at Tufts Medical Center. And um, I did my training at the Cleveland Clinic and finished about six years ago. And I've been in practice and have joined the group at Tufts Medical Center. And uh, myectomy has been part of my life for about eight years now, um, and I am glad to be here tonight with everybody. Thank you. So the uh, International HCM Summit wrapped up recently, and it was really a, a fantastic um, time. Um, the Marins should be commended for their excellent work. Uh, lots and lots of great speakers, lots of great talks. It really was, was very... Um, educational and, and a lot of great patient uh, stories. It, it was really, really a nice, good summit. From, from my perspective as a surgeon uh, being involved with this, there were a number of talks that were uh, geared towards the surgical management of HCM. And Joe Duraney from the Mayo Clinic uh, gave sort of the major talk on that when, and he really stressed uh, what we know is that the surgical myectomy is still the gold standard uh, to manage drug refractory heart, sim heart failure symptoms in HCM. He presented a lot of great data that, that showed that the operation is uh, effective, it's safe, it's durable, the vast majority of patients gain a great benefit from this, and that there's, there's a lot of uh, good that comes from this. Um, he presented a lot of their data and spoke about um, the experience with uh, myectomy surgery. Um, 
other talks talked about the aggressive management of atrial fibrillation. This is something that's um, really coming to the forefront in, in cardiac surgery uh, of all types, that we need to be aggressive with atrial fibrillation management. Uh, when patients have a history of atrial fibrillation, we should be really looking at doing the, what we call the full COX-4 maze to do our best to minimize um, AFib recurrence and to take the left atrial appendage to decrease stroke risk. And so this is a very important topic that um, is important not only in myectomy, but in, in many aspects of uh, cardiac surgery. There are a number of areas of discussion that came up where there, there, there's still some, some discussion among specialists about what to do and how to manage different things. Um, you know, Dr. Uh, Paulo Spirito uh, gave a talk about, is there a role for earlier myectomy? Um, this is again, a topic that comes up amongst cardiac surgeons in, in different areas. Um, in the, in the topics of um, uh, mitral valve surgery, aortic uh, aneurysm surgery, um, as well as myectomy, when there's a mechanical problem, uh, should we wait uh, longer or should we deal with it earlier? So a, a lot of discussion around that right now. Certainly no, no clear answers at this point. The, the guidelines within HCM are pretty clear about when um, patients should have an operation, but an interesting point of discussion. Uh, another area of discussion that has been ongoing for quite a long time is how to manage the mitral valve during septomyectomy. And a number of the centers have philosophies about this and, and some are to involve the mitral, you know, to repair the mitral valve on a, on a regular basis. Some are rare about it. Uh, certainly one of the things that is, is definitely clear that if, if there's a problem with the mitral valve, an intrinsic problem with the mitral valve, that should be repaired at the time of HCM uh, surgery. Um, other, you know, discussions around uh, should the mitral valve, if it's otherwise normal, be left alone uh, with long leaflets and things like that. Um, there's really a discussion around that, but at the end of the day, I think Barry Marin sort of said it well, which is that there's a lot of ways to get to the top of the mountain. And despite some, some differences of opinion, uh, centers are getting great outcomes and that's the most important thing. Um, one of the areas that comes up uh, with questions is, is, the, is the role of minimally invasive and robotic myectomy. Um, certainly there's, there are people talking about this. Uh, it's a big uh, discussion point amongst surgeons. Um, there's a few centers that are, are doing it, um, but it's, it's not clear yet that this is ready for, for prime time. Um, and so that will be defined over the next several years, I imagine, um, but, but an interesting point nonetheless. Um, so all in all, a lot of great talks, um, a lot of wonderful um, thoughts and, and different points. But uh, at the end of the day, I think the, the, the point that uh, surgical myectomy still remains uh, the gold standard for treating things and um, is, is a good operation, I think is very important. All right. Again, I'd like to thank you, Lisa, so much for the opportunity. I really appreciate it. It is lovely to have you here. And I skipped lunch today and my husband brought me tacos. So I'm a very happy wife right now. Um, okay. So I'm going to remind everybody to take the survey for the last second here. And then we're going to move on to our next talk. Um, but before we do that, I did want to bring up a couple of interesting points from the summit and pretty much from HCM care in general. The debate between touch the mitral valve and don't touch the mitral valve. And where, where do you think we're going with this? What was your take home message? You know, my, my take home message is that for, for a lot of patients, you, you can go either way. I think one of the points that came up said important, that is important that when you're looking at thin septum myectomy, when the septum is you know, 11, 12, even 13 millimeters, um, you can't take a whole lot of muscle. 
And so in those cases, I think you're, you're, you're more likely to need to do something with the mitral valve to stiffen it, to shorten it, to keep it out of the left ventricular outflow, outflow tract to avoid SAM. And so each patient I think needs to be looked at individually to decide sort of what, what the best course of action is. With, with thick septums, if you have a 20, 23 millimeter septum, most of the time a myectomy itself is gonna be effective. But at the end of the day, I think looking at each patient individually is gonna be the key. I think that tends to be the, the mantra with HCM. We're all the same, but we're all completely different. So it's a case by case situation. Mm -hmm. uh, and I, I appreciate that that can be quite the challenge when it's coming down to those management decisions. Mm -hmm. Okay, I'm gonna end the poll right now and I'm gonna put that up. And next up we, we have Ethan, excuse me, Ethan. And I think we there's a little uh, error in the actual talk. So he can go over that with you in just a moment. But I do wanna share the results. Uh, with you today. You should be seeing the results. Um, you can give me one second. I'm just going to tell everybody that most of you are from the Northeast. Some of you are from the Southeast, but we do have Midwest, Southwest um, Europe covered here today. 57% um, uh, are patients. 29% are patients with a family member with HCM. And 11% have family members who are diagnosed. And we have a couple of healthcare providers with us this evening as well. Um, no just curious is. I've always wondered who the just curious is would be to show up anyway. 18% um, of uh, you who are watching tonight were diet or that took the poll were diagnosed in the past two years. 54% of you are on medication. 29% have devices, ICDs specifically. 39% uh, have had a septal reduction therapy, either myectomy or alcohol ablation. 39% have had atrial fibrillation, 21% of us have lost a loved one, uh, one other person's had a transplant, and then if Amy and I are here with transplant too, so that makes three of us in one room, we're a rare breed, 57% um, have had genetic testing, and somebody out here has been advised to get an ICD, but has not done so yet. And two people here have, uh, have been advised to consider septal reduction therapy and are working on making their decisions up. So um, it's just kind of an interesting snapshot. So you see who's actually here with us tonight and what some of the questions might be as we move forward. Okay, so Ethan, now I'm gonna hand it over to you and now you can share your slides. Okay, can you see my slides? We can see them, but they're not in present mode. And yep. with one little click, I think they'll be in present mode. And they are. Perfect. Stage is yours. Excellent. Thanks, Lisa. And thanks for hosting another a great event. Um, I'm going to talk about two um, areas within HCM um, that um, I think are really important and in many ways get a lot less attention than other areas. Um, one is atrial fibrillation, and then the other is the non-obstructive form of the disease. Um, and both these are areas that really um, interest me in terms of trying to better define and hopefully um, identify treatments uh, for our patients and strategies. So gonna start by talking about atrial fibrillation. These are my disclosures. So first, Obviously, what is atrial fibrillation? And it's something we call AFib or AF. Um, and it's an irregular, often rapid heart rate um, where the heart really doesn't function as efficiently as it should. Normally, um, in your heart, the top chamber is the atrium beat, and then the bottom chamber, the ventricle beats. Um, but what happens in atrial fibrillation is that the top chamber really beats abnormally and therefore doesn't beat in sync with the bottom chamber. And patients specifically with HCM tend to be very symptomatic when they go into atrial fibrillation, frequently develop um, a lot of palpitations, feeling like your heart is racing, and it can worsen other symptoms that might be mild or not even present before, such as fatigue, more short of breath, either at rest or when trying to do things, or lightheadedness and dizziness. 
Sometimes it can be asymptomatic, uh, but less commonly in HCM. Notably, not though all palpitations are not atrial fibrillation. Um, so if you are having palpitations, it doesn't necessarily mean you're having AFib. And to better um, characterize that, um, you know, first we start with an EKG, an electrocardiogram, um, which will say if you're in AFib or not. But if you're not having those symptoms when you're in the office, um, then we'll frequently do ambulatory monitors to better assess what's happening on a more day-to-day -day basis. And so why am I spending time talking about this? Um, it's really important to realize that AFib is really common in HCM. Um, if you look at um, how patients do during their lifetime with HCM, um, AFib is the second most common uh, disease complication with 20% of HCM patients developing AFib during their lifetime. Um, and if you compare that to age and gender ma match populations, um, the rate of atrial fibrillation, which can occur outside of AFib, um, HCM, is much more common in HCM patients, four to six times higher than the general population. As I mentioned, it tends to be really symptomatic. So people feel really poorly when they're in AFib. And so our treatment is focused on two things. One is blood thinners um, because um, the top chamber is beating ineffectively and blood can pool there and that can lead to blood clots. And ultimately if that blood clot moves a stroke and blood thinners really prevent that from occurring. And then the second is really focusing on getting rhythm back to normal, um, what we call a rhythm control strategy. Um, and when you go back from AFib back to normal rhythm, the symptoms you are having should also go back to normal. And we've recognized recently and is highlighted in the summit that we have more options from a medication standpoint to control rhythm. Um, in the past, the only drug we had was a drug called amiodarone, um, which is a drug um, that can have a lot of side effects outside of the heart, especially when we're talking about using it for young individuals for long term. Um, so we have a number of different drugs um, called sotalol, dofetilide, or disopyramide, um, which we can use to help prevent AFib from coming back, um, which have much better safety profiles. That being said, you really have to closely monitor the initiation of a lot of these drugs. So often you need to be hospitalized to start them. The drugs though sometimes can have side effects um, or you can have recurrent AFib despite the medications. Um, and that's when we talk about other things to do, um, which whether it be switch to another medication or talk about ablations. And Dr. Robich spoke about a maze procedure, um, which is an extensive surgical ablation procedure, which can be done to try to prevent AFib but it is heart surgery and it's really done only in obstructive HCM patients who are undergoing myectomy. Another option is a minimally invasive procedure called an AFib catheter ablation. Um, so it's done through the groin, much less extensive recovery from it. But it's important to realize that while that procedure is curative, quote unquote, of AFib in 90% of patients in the general population, its efficacy, unfortunately, is much less in HCM. And so we often need to either repeat the ablation to control AFib or combine it with other, those drugs that we spoke about. So our strategy really tends to be starting with a drug, um, making sure it's well tolerated, um, and if it's drugs are not well tolerated or have recurrent AFib on the drug, um, that's really when we start talking about the ablations. 
So as I mentioned, stroke risk with AFib is increased. Um, and unlike other diseases where we have ways to risk stratify who needs to be on blood thinners, that's not the case in HCM because all HCM patients with AFib, that stroke risk is increased. And therefore blood thinners, such as the name brands that you've probably seen commercials for, Eliquis, um, Xarelto, um, or Coumadin, or Pradaxa, um, really should be initiated in all HCM patients after their first symptomatic AFib episode. And these dr drugs um, are really effective in that um, when they are started, um, stroke risk afterwards is extraordinarily low. Um, so they're effective, but they are blood thinners. Um, and so always have to be concerned about bleeding with them. Um, but for the vast majority of patients can be really well tolerated and offer the protection that is needed. And, you know, are these treatment algorithms that I spoke about have really altered the natural history in many way of AFib in HCM. You know, in the past, we really had poor treatments options and patients would have a lot, a lot of symptoms from the AFib and the amount of patients who had a, a advanced symptoms have dramatically decreased um, from over 50% 20 years ago to only 10% of patients with AFib having symptom, severe symptoms. Risk, as I said, of stroke has dramatically decreased with the use of blood thinners and especially the ability to use these novel agents, um, not Coumadin, which require less monitoring um, and tend to be better tolerated. And mortality with these treatments has also dramatically decreased um, in large part because of our ability to keep patients in normal rhythm and also um, protecting from stroke. So in summary, as, as it relates to AFib, um, it's important to realize that it's not inevitably progressive. We do have treatments out there to help prevent you going back into atrial fibrillation. The treatments allow for long life um, for, men, for the vast majority of patients with AFib, um, but increased risk of stroke and therefore really a low threshold to start on blood thinners. Uh, but for all the, the majority of patients with AFib, we do have good treatment options. Certainly, um, you know, some patients do not do well with treatment and we are always looking for better treatments for atrial fibrillation, such as drugs with less side effects is always um, what we're searching for, for treatment and that are more effective. Thank you, Ethan. I have a, you're gonna pivot to non-obstructed, but there's a yep. question that came in that I would, just like to stay up on the AFib thing so we can stay on topic here. Perfect. There's a question as to why, why is there an increased risk of atrial fibrillation in HCM? What is the mechanism? Yeah, it, it's probably multiple. Um, so one is because the ventricle, the bottom chamber of the heart, the walls are thick and function is abnormal because the walls are thick pressure builds up into the top chamber, the atrium, and that can drive atrial fibrillation. In addition, just like the bottom chamber of the heart has a myopathy, meaning an abnormality, the top chamber of the heart, the atrium, can have a myopathy as well. Um, and so the atrium in HCM patients can be abnormal um, just in itself, independent of pressures in the bottom chamber. And those two things are primarily the driver of AFib and HCM. Other things um, external to HCM can impact AFib development, such as weight, obstructive sleep apnea, um, which are strong drivers for AFib in the general population. They can also impact AFib risk in HCM 
but to a less degree than in the general population. We have another, we have a couple of questions on AFib. Um, okay, I'm just gonna do a couple more and then we're gonna let Ethan finish his talk. Um, so with the treatments listed on the side, slides above, how many affected AFib patients successfully return to sinus rhythm indefinitely? What percentage spend most days in sinus rhythm? That's a tough one. Yeah, that is a tough one. Um, but it seems um, from the data that over, you know, about a 10 year follow up, about 75% of patients will have their AFib well controlled um, and stay in sinus rhythm with HCM. Um, that being said, within that 75 are patients who've had treatment, quote unquote, failures and needed to change strategy, whether it going from a drug to an ablation or changing a drug. Um, so it, it is, it ends up being, um, while some patients, we have a single treatment strategy that will maintain them lifelong. A lot of patients, um, you do well for AFib for a few years, um, and then you're changing your treatment strategy because more AFib pops up. So two questions and then we're gonna move on. Uh, and Paul, I was gonna ask this question, so yours is gonna go last. And I don't know that I fully understand the other question. Can patients be on top of increased, on top of increased their AFib? Should patients be on top of their atrial measurements? So we know that the larger the dimension of the AV, is, or the, the uh, atria is, the more AFib that you get. But what can, can patients do anything to mitigate stretch of the atria? I guess is really the question. Yeah, comp, really great question um, and very complicated answer. Um, for obstructive HCM patients, um, there's some data that suggests that if you relieve obstruction, the atrial size will decrease um, because you're decreasing pressure um, in the bottom chamber of the heart and thereby in the atria. Um, and um, we um, are presenting work that shows that after myectomy, um, AFib risk um, is substantially lower um, than obstructive patients who have not undergone myectomy. Um, that being said, it is not definitive that atrial rel remodel. Um, and for many patients with non-obstructive HCM, for example, um, or even after a myectomy, the atria may still get enlarged um, or enlarge. Um, but it's really very, like many things in HCM heterogeneous, where for some page, a lot, the majority of patients' atrial size will change minimally over time. But for some patients, we see you know, big changes um, in atria. So a complicated way of saying very complicated question and complicated process that is still under investigation by many as to what's really the driver in some cases. So the next question was the one I was going to ask you. So Paul, thank you. Watchman in HCM. So there's a lot of excitement on the idea of getting off of blood thinners, but is Watchman right for everybody? Well, first, let me say, um, Watchman has not been studied in HCM. And I'll tell you my concerns, which are significant with the use of Watchman in HCM. So Watchman, um, as you said, is, is a great option um, because it allows people in the general population to get off blood thinners. But the difference here is, as I said, the atrium in HCM patients, the top chambers are much more abnormal and there's a higher risk of stroke in HCM than the general population. And we don't think that the, the Watchman device only protects against one very small area in the top chamber against stroke. Um, and because there's a primi pri primary atrial myopathy 
I'm very concerned that stroke risk will remain from the other areas of the atrium, especially in HCM patients. So the only times I personally have recommended it was when patients were unable to tolerate blood thinners um, because of other issues. Um, but for the majority of my patients, I, I do not recommend it um, just because of my concerns that stroke risk might persist um, after that device placement. You're muted, Lisa, sorry. You're, you're done with that part. So now on to the non-obstructives. The questions Thanks. are done. Thanks, Ethan. Excellent. Okay, so no, another area i um, gonna talk about separate is non-obstructive HCM. And so first, you know, what do I mean by that? Um, you know, obstructive HCM, as many people in this very educated audience know, is when the mitral valve makes an um, abnormal bend, hits the heart muscle where it's thick, causing high pressures in the um, LV cavity in the heart. Non-obstructive HCM by definition is when that phenomenon does not occur. But it's more complicated than that because obstruction is very dynamic. It can come and go and different things will make obstruction worse. And so we can't just do an echocardiogram at rest and say, oh, you don't have obstruction, you have non-obstructive HCM. You really have to do maneuvers to try to look for obstruction. And that's really important as we'll be talking about as it relates to treatment um, because obstructive HCM patients, we start with medications, but if symptoms progress, um, opens up the opportunity for myectomy or alcohol ablation uh, procedures, which will relieve the obstruction and in the majority of HCM patients improve symptoms dramatically. So to say you have non-obstructive HCM, you really have to do maneuvers such as a stress echo or other provocative maneuvers to really make sure you don't have obstruction and after that, then you can say you have the non-obstructive form of HCM. So non-obstructive HCM patients, about 50% will have symptoms such as shortness of breath with activity, fatigue. Um, the, and about 50% will have no or minimal symptoms. When People have symptoms, that's when we start talking about medications. Um, and for the majority of those individuals, the medications, beta blockers or calcium channel blockers will keep symptoms to be mild or moderate in degree. About 10% of patients with non-obstructive HCM will fail those drugs um, and have refractory symptoms. And those severe symptoms um, is what we term an end-stage HCM. A bad name, um, in my opinion, just because it's saying um, the disease, the heart is failing and it's an ominous term, but nonetheless um, is a concerning scenario when symptoms or patients are feeling so poorly um, that, and we, our medications are not working. Fortunately, the percentage of patients who develop those degree of advanced symptoms is uncommon in non-obstructive HCM, um, particularly when you compare that to patients with resting or provocable obstruction, proportion of patients who develop severe symptoms is in yellow here. So about 10% in non-obstructive HCM as compared to 20 or 40% of patients with obstructive form. The difference though here is really about treatment because when severe symptoms occur in patients with obstruction, again, opens up the opportunity for myectomy or alcohol ablation to relieve obstruction. But for the majority of non-obstructive patients, that doesn't really work 
um, as a treatment and we have limited medications. So those patients, those 10% of patients who have refractory advanced symptoms is what we call, as I said, end-stage HCM. And we classify that based on ejection fraction, how the heart squeezes. Does the heart squeeze abnormally, what we call systolic dysfunction, so where it's squeezing weakly? Or is the heart squeeze normal, but other areas that are causing symptoms in terms of the function? And that's what we call preserved systolic function. And that's based on, both of those are based on ejection fraction. So when it's low, less than 50%, um, which is a dramatic decrease in HCM patients, that's systolic dysfunction. And when it's over 50, that's considered preserved systolic function in HCM. And let's talk about each of those subgroups separately for a minute. Um, so systolic dysfunction, typically, not only is the heart contraction weak, but actually the cavity, the size of the heart becomes larger, but the thick heart muscle, which is the very thing that defines HCM, will often become thinner. As I said, it's an uncommon phenomenon. It occurs in about 3% of the general HCM population. And it occurs because of the development of a large burden of scarring um, of the heart muscle. These are examples. On the left is a cardiac MRI. Um, normal heart muscle, which should be here, is normally black. These areas that are bright where my arrows are, are areas of scar. And so these hearts, as I said, have a ton of scarring, um, some of the most scarred hearts in any disease state. And then this is same slice, and this is from a patient who underwent heart transplant where normal muscle is pink. And you can see all the areas of blue here with the blue representing scarring. Those hearts look dramatically different from the patients with end-stage HCM and preserved function. In those patients, there's actually no evidence of significant chamber remodeling. So those hearts look like the normal hearts for an HCM patient um, where the walls are thick, the cavity is tiny, and as I said, the squeeze is normal. And similarly, they have much less extensive scarring, um, often mild to minimal. Um, and these are examples um, here. Again, cardiac MRI image, different plane, but here is the normal heart muscle. And you can see really no scarring, no areas of bright in it. And here um, is another patient who underwent heart transplant where that pink tannish um, is the normal color for muscle in this patient, different stain, and the areas of bright or areas of scar. So much less scar, much less extensive um, in patients with preserved ejection fraction. And because those hearts look normal, it's much harder to identify patients with HCM and preserved ejection fraction and really um, need to take symptoms seriously here in order to identify them and make sure we're getting them on the right treatment pathway. As I said though, um, patients with preserved ejection fraction, development of advanced symptoms is really uncommon. So the majority of patients in blue really have mild, moderate symptoms, and it's just the 10% who have advanced symptoms. That's in contrast to patients where the squeeze, the ejection fraction decreases, where advanced symptoms is much more common, where over 50% of those patients um, with low squeeze will uh, develop advanced symptoms. 
but fortunately much less common in the overall HCM population. What's treatment? So if first is increased risk for ventricular arrhythmias as um, Dr. Marin's gonna talk about in a little bit and therefore really need consideration for primary prevention ICD. Um, once ejection fraction drops less than 50 or advanced symptoms with non-obstructive HCM develop. We start medications, base beta blockers, verapamil, ACE inhibitors, aldactone. Um, but unfortunately, um, these medications um, tend not to be as effective as, as we'd like them to be. Sometimes we have options, um, something called the cardiac resynchronization therapy, which is a special type of ICD, but um, only a select group of patients have that as an option to try to improve function. And then when some symptoms are severe, that's where we're talking about heart transplant. Unfortunately, um, survival after heart transplant um, in HCM patients is very good, uh, but it's a long road to get there. And certainly we need better treatments for end-stage HCM than just transplant. So you have non-obstructive HCM. First, I think um, a measure of reassurance. So the development of severe disabling symptoms is really uncommon with non-obstructive HCM. If you do develop severe symptoms, it's really important to make sure that you do not have obstruction and you have truly non-obstructive uh, form of HCM um, because treatment options are different here. We start with medications, which for a lot of patients will do the trick to control symptoms. But that being said, if you have severe symptoms despite medications, that's really where we need to be um, aggressive about thinking about transplant um, and evaluation for it. And for that reason, in my opinion, um, end-stage non-obstructive HCM is really perhaps the major unmet treatment need in HCM, where we really need much better medications um, to prevent symptom progression and improve symptoms for these patients. And um, as you know, exciting time in HCM um, where pharmaceutical companies um, are for the first time really focusing um, on trying to improve our treatment options for patients. Thank you. Well, I can say that those who have gone down that transplant route, there's two of us right here on the screen, it is a long process. Um, it's one that is different than the HCM life that we once knew, but it is an amazing option. And there's about 4% of us that will land there. <clears throat> I do want to take a moment and say, you know, organ donation, most of the people that are listening to this have HCM, their hearts would not be accepted to donate to somebody else. However, um, I come from a family where my sister was a donor and I was a recipient. So I ask you to have a conversation with your family members about your choices for organ donation and what your wishes would be if your life was not able to be sustained any longer. So please give some consideration to that. Have a discussion with your family. I think it's critically important. I also want to take a moment, and I don't know if you knew this or not, Ethan, but we have expanded the donor pool by something called deceased donors. Um, and the very first female who received a deceased donor heart in the United States was a member of our community. She lives in New Jersey and she's doing very well today. So there are advances coming down that pathway as well. And I think you did a really great job of summarizing the battle of the non-obstructed and we completely agree that it is a complete unmet need. We need more here. Um, and HCMA is happy to be working with Imbria and your institution and five others to do a recruitment for a trial and a drug for the non-obstructants, 
which is a symptom uh, reliever, not a cure, but um, we need more tools in the toolbox. Okay, we have a couple of questions for you that came in afterwards. Anybody else have any questions about uh, non-obstructive HCM, please post them now. The first question was actually from the last group, but I think she put it in the chat, not in the question, and I didn't see it. I'm so sorry. Um, while having a myectomy, my surgeon did a mates and also did LAAC. Um, I also have an ICD. So I've not known if I had AFib events since April of this of 2021. Do I still need a blood thinner? How does a patient evaluate their current AFib burden after a maze? So um, again, great question. Um, what, one caveat I will say there, which obviously I don't know, know, know um, your personal history, but there are different types of ICDs um, and not all ICDs will capture atrial fibrillation um, um, accurately. Um, so just be, if it's a single chamber ICD or a subcutaneous ICD, um, those do not do a great job necessarily in capturing atrial fibrillation. So hesitancy to say that you definitively haven't had AFib. That being said, um, you know, our strategy here um, tends to be after a maze with left atrial appendage ligation without recurrent AFib, we do monitors just to make sure again, no AFib. And if no recurrent AFib at about a year after the surgery, um, that's when we'll have a conversation about um, whether or not we should be stopping anticoagulation. And it's always kind of a risk benefit discussion there. Um, but, but you're right, if uh, the my maze is relatively curative for AFib and you're not having it, do you really need to be on lifelong anticoagulation? And some patients will decide um, that they prefer not to be on it, but obviously always need to be continuously monitored just to see if they have recurrent AFib. So we need to continue to monitor for most devices. Um, the other consideration here for those who have implantable devices, to put the AFib monitor on actually takes battery life. So you really wanna think carefully if you wanna sacrifice battery life or just do a, a Zio patch or a Holter monitor to reserve that battery life. <clears throat> it may not seem like a lot, but if you're at the last two, three months of your device, you might want a little bit longer because you, know, you want that time. Um, other questions. Uh, what defines, what's your definition of severe symptoms? You know, obviously that in many ways is, is patient specific. Um, and I don't feel it's you know, the cardiologist's job to define severe symptoms. But when you start talking about transplant, um, it really means you know, that you're limited such that a lot of people will say, can't walk a, um, a block on level ground without feeling winded, can't walk a flight of stairs, those are the types, the scenario when you really need to be thinking that the symptoms have really become severe and we really need to be aggressive. So as somebody who has been that, I went from being able to be highly functional, I'd say, to not being able to walk down the stairs to my front door to get to my mailbox on a given day. I literally had to stay on the top floor of my house because I couldn't do the stairs coming back up. That's how bad things got. Um, and I, I still think back at those days and the fact that I'm sitting here talking to you today, feeling so well is a miracle. Um, miracle of science, I'll, I'll, I'll qualify that with. And a uh, lot of gratitude to everybody who's done the research to bring that as far as it's gone. A couple more questions. Um, I don't know what that means, Jan. Um, and Justin, I, I'm gonna ask Justin to elucidate on his question a little bit. These three words together, I'm not quite sure what you mean by double lead chamber. If you want to rewrite that question, I'll address it and I'm going to move on. Okay, so Jan asked two questions. Um, what is diastolic dysfunction in HCM? And if you've already had a myectomy and now have diastolic dysfunction, what does that mean? Or what could that mean? So, so one, you know, Diastolic dysfunction in, in general means that as the heart contracts, it doesn't relax normally. 
Um, the one problem that we have is that diastolic dysfunction measures by echo are not reliable in many HCM patients. So nearly every HCM patient will have quote unquote diastolic dysfunction on their echo. And that's just a measure of the fact that their heart muscle is thick, which we already know. So we don't really do management based on echo diastolic dysfunction. It's really based on symptoms or other um, areas that we can look for for diastolic function. So, sorry, is there more to that question? No, I'm just writing Justin a note saying, I don't know what your question is. And Jan says, thank you. She gets that one. Um, I just want to talk about the terminology, diastolic dysfunction. Patients see it on their echo report and they kind of get a little panicky, like what, what are those big words? What does it mean? And how common is it? So can we just talk about the commonality of mild diastolic dysfunction versus severe or grade three diastolic dysfunction and how variable those degrees are? Yeah, grade one and grade, so there's, as, as Lisa's saying, there's three grades of diastolic dysfunction by echo, at least in the old terminology, um, which is what the most commonly used are. Uh, grade one, um, grade two, and grade three, with grade three being more severe and grade one being more mild. Almost every HCM patient will have grade one or grade two uh, diastolic dysfunction measured by echo. Um, and so if you have one or two and you're feeling good, it's really not anything to be concerned by. Grade three is a little bit more concerning of a finding because it means that the pressures in the top chamber are elevated. Um, and um, is a scenario where we, we want to closely, more closely follow you because there's a little bit higher risk for developing advanced symptoms, but it's pretty nonspecific in HCM. Um, so again, we commonly see patients who are, have excellent exercise tolerance, but have grade three diastolic dysfunction. So a little bit less meaningful in HCM than the general population. Okay, so I got an answer on Justin's question. So I think he was referring to what kind of devices can be used to monitor atrial arrhythmias, and he's writing double lead ICD chamber to record AFib and others. Uh, it's the Medtronic device. Yes, there is the ability to record AFib, but there's a cost benefit there. If it's really um, something that you're concerned with, yeah, you can turn your device on and monitor it, but it might just take up a lot more battery and you could use a wearable device. That was kind of my point. Um, okay, Ethan, I wanna go back to AFib for just a moment and I wanna discuss wearable devices for monitoring. Um, this is kind of a, an emerging area. Um, we have Fitbits with the Sense now, which I haven't quite figured out how to get my EKG on this yet. I just haven't really taken this time to figure it out. We have uh, the Alive Core or Cardia Monitor. We have Apple Watches. There's a lot of technology that we can utilize. Um, what are your views on using this technology? I, I, I love it, first of all. Um, you know, I think it really empowers people to know what their rhythm is and when they're having symptoms, they can generate um, an ECG um, with a rhythm strip. Um, to see exactly what the rhythm is. And then if it's concerning, they can share it with their cardiologist. Um, the, that being said, yet you do have to um, take the reading on top a little bit with a grain of salt. It is a machine. It is not always accurate. You know, uh, just the other day, I had the scenario where it was reading um, a fit for a patient, but it was really sinus rhythm with uh, extra beats, PACs. Um, so it's not perfect, um, but I, the fact that you can generate a strip and share it with your providers is really encouraging. The one scenario a little bit more hesitant with is the older generation of the Apple Watch where it doesn't have an ECG strip with it. Um, and it's just an algorithm trying to detect irregular heartbeats. Um, 
And so much less sensitive and specific, the algorithms for detecting AFib. Um, and you can't generate that ECG lead to really share with your cardiologist to check. Um, but the newer generations are great because they have that feature. I can remember the the end of my old heart, I already got a lot of emails from me from my cardio monitor, I'm like, what is this? What is this? So there was a lot of um, a, a lot of uh, questions there. Um, okay, so I think we have answered all the questions that are on the table at the moment. You have an opportunity to ask some questions again at the end of Dr. Marin's segment. So I'm hoping the kids are leaving Marty alone for a few minutes and he can come on camera with us and unmute himself and begin to present. I'm getting a little nervous because I haven't seen him pop back in yet. Marty, you're on deck. And three, two, Marty. Oh, Dr. Marin, paging Dr. Marin. Okay, so we're gonna go with the old cell phone approach here. Um, I'm here. <laughs> you're I'm there. Here. <laughs> I, I know you got your hands full, and uh, thank you so yeah, much. I'm a single parent right now, so um, oh, no. that was going to work out. So we got a delay in the other parent coming home. So I'll do the best I can. Um, I, I would jump in and babysit, but I'm a little far away. Got it. Okay. okay. I'm okay. Kid set. We, we are going to challenge, and we're going to see how well a dad can multitask. I'll do the best. I'll do the best I can. All right. So can you see my slides here? We gotcha. Thank you. Right. So I just want to thank Ethan and Mike. Those were great overviews. Appreciate them putting that together. That was great. And thanks, Amy, for helping to put all this together organizationally as well. So thanks, Amy. So I, I I'm gonna just touch a little bit on um, you know, a really obviously really important area. Um, that we dedicated obviously a lot of time to at the summit, which is sudden death prevention in HCM. And, you know, there, as you've sort of, you know, heard today, and I think as many on, on, on listening realize, there are different kind of pathways that patients with HCM can um, be at risk for. Um, we talked about heart failure with obstruction, non obstructive atrial fibrillation. And um, now we're going to be talking about another pathway, which is arrhythmic or electrical sudden death. Um, and, you know, the, the reality is that there are patients with HCM in whom it's possible that the only manifestation of their disease at any point in their whole life could be a sudden arrhythmic event. Um, and so there's an enormous, uh, obviously for that reason, enormous importance on identifying to the best that we can, those HCM patients that are at high risk for that to happen because we've got the opportunity today um, to protect them from that event, which is the ICD, um, plantable cardioverter defibrillator, ICD. And so the, you know, the holy grail, so to speak, has been always um, really the ability to identify, as I just said, those HCM patients within the large heterogeneous population of patients with this disease who are at the greatest risk and the most deserving then of the ICD to protect them against a sudden death event at all at any point the rest of their life. And so what, what is a really important point then in terms of that is that in, in HCM, which is obviously a complex, and when we talk about heterogeneous disease, there's a lot of variability to the disease expression and, and, the, and the natural history of, of the disease for patients, um, that there's never really going to be, I think, a perfectly reliable strategy here. And that's the point. There's never gonna be a perfectly reliable strategy. I don't think we're ever going to get to a point where we're gonna have a tool or a, a strategy or a method that we can apply to this disease that will all be 100% in identifying those patients that need a device to protect them against sudden death and to identify those patients that absolutely don't need an ICD. That's just a probably an unreasonable aspiration given the complexities 
of the disease and the overall low event rate that we're talking about here. And so that means kind of a way to kind of look at this, and <clears throat> we talked a lot about this at, at the summit, is that any, any kind of strategy that one takes then to apply to HCM to try to identify those patients that are at greatest risk will have to balance between two issues. The ability to preserve as much life as possible to protect as many patients as we can. Um, and when we do that, we have to accept that this seesaw will go up in this direction and that there'll be an increase when we do that of the number of devices that are implanted and the potential complications that come with devices. Or we can, you know, or the strategy can be the other way, it can put a little bit more weight on the other end of the seesaw, where we want to try to do our best to decrease the number of ICDs that we implant and therefore decrease complications. But when we do that, we have to accept that there may be an increase in the number of patients with ACM that are left unprotected potentially for sudden death. So this really represents the challenge um, that we have um, as cardiologists and HCM experts in approaching this strategy of sudden death prevention in this disease. It's, it's, it really ultimately comes down to this, this balance in a way um, and, and which side do we wanna put the greatest weight and emphasis on. And we made it as a as a expert committee, the guidelines, the HCM guidelines, um, which I was part of, but was one member of, there was probably 20, 25 cardiologists that put came together for a two year period and put together the most recent expert guidelines on HCM that were published in the American College of Cardiology last fall. And the weight of our recommendations was that we thought we would uh, promote the strategy that we thought was going to preserve or probably the opportunity to preserve as many lives as possible. And we also, when we did that, accepted that we would probably over-treat to some degree patients with some slight excess in the number of ICDs and have to accept as I said, some of the complications that come with that in order to save as many often young, otherwise healthy lives with HCM from this catastrophic out of the blue arrhythmic event. And that strategy that we advanced as the predominant way of identifying patients with this disease who are at risk for sudden death is based, is here in this slide, and it's based on the presence of one or more non-invasive risk markers, called the major risk markers. And they're listed here. And these have been shown, each of these in numerous different studies over the last couple of decades to be associated with an increased risk of sudden death. So family, family history of HCM, Family of HC, family history of HCM, sudden death, and a first or close relative. I'm doing something right now, you gotta go. No, you no, gotta go. No, no, yeah, you gotta go. No okay. more, no more black berries. Okay. Can you go? No more black okay. berries. Okay. No more black berries. Okay, I heard you. Go watch TV. Can I have more? And then unex no, can I have more black Yes, berries? go ahead. Unexplained <laughs> syncope, particularly when it happens recently to the time of evaluation. Um, ambulatory monitoring with non-sustained VT and when the massive, massive left ventricular hypertrophy. <laughs> And then we've got new risk markers as well that have come along since the last guidelines 10 years ago, which include the presence of an apical aneurysm, extensive scarring, and systolic dysfunction. So these are our major markers. And the presence really of one or more of these markers can identify a patient that may be at increased risk for sudden death and who therefore it would be reasonable. Those are the words we use, reasonable to consider an ICD after again taking it after again taking into account um, the individual kind of wishes and desires of the patients, their risks and benefits of the ICD, you know, the so-called shared decision-making discussion, of course, about the pros and cons of lifelong device therapy balanced against the risk 
of the catastrophic event of sudden death. So this is the risk stratification strategy that we use and apply every time we see a patient and evaluate them um, for their risk of sudden death. And I'll just say that these risk markers are most applicable as well to young and middle-aged HCM patients. And when you achieve you know, a, 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 an age of 60 years or beyond, it's a little bit of an arbitrary cut point, but older HCM patients um, in general are at very low risk for sudden death, even with one or more of these markers. So the bar really to put an ICD in an older HCM patient is, has to be much higher than a younger middle-aged patient. And um, I just wanna make a couple comments here about the, the strategy that I just showed you. And one is that it's flexible and can incorporate new markers that emerge. And that's happened since the last guidelines 10 years ago, apical aneurysm, extensive scarring by MRI. And when the ejection fracture, the pump function drops to below 50% are new markers in a way of sudden death risk. And those have come along really and have been substantiated since the last guidelines. That's why they're on there now. And so the ability to add new markers to help improve the reliability of this strategy is one of the strengths of this of the AHA ACC risk stratification strategy that I'm showing you. It also can allow for the opportunity for physician judgment and reasoning, which is so important in HCM. And you have to have, that's why you know, these centers of excellence and the experts that see this disease a lot develop over an experience, judgment and reasoning that, pay, that, that physicians that don't see HCM as much, you know, just can't develop as well or as, as, as strongly. And that physician judgment and reasoning can be applied here in different ways to help make decisions, particularly when those, there's sort of gray areas. So we rely on expertise here as well when we're applying those risk markers to make decisions about ICD. And we always incorporate the wishes and desires of the patient that is fully educated and informed, including of course, as I said, about the downsides and limitations of the ICD when we're trying to make a decision as well. And so that strategy that I just showed you is particularly amenable to kind of integrating shared decision-making with the patient as well. And the strategy is also highly sensitive, meaning that if you use those markers I just showed you, there's a high chance you will identify those patients that are at the greatest risk for sudden death to offer them the possibility of protection with the ICD. Just a, just a, yeah, I think we've talked a little bit about this, but just some of the new markers that I just mentioned, there's some patients with HCM that develop aneurysms. These are wall thinning of the apex. You can see that here in these MRIs where the tip of the heart is thinned out and that's because over time, we believe that some patients with HCM are susceptible to changes of the structure of the heart where the wall thins and becomes scarred. And when that happens, that results in an increased risk for sudden death because of the scarred, thin aneurysm at the tip of the heart. And as Ethan was talking about below here, some patients with HCM develop decrease in pump function or decrease in what we call ejection fraction. And when, it, when that ejection fraction by the echo falls below 50%, that's usually because there's a lot of scarring that develops that causes the decrease in EF. Those patients are at increased risk for sudden death as well and are deserving of the, the possibility of ICD is in that situation. These are data that Ethan put together and were a major reason for their incorporation into the new guidelines and have made a huge impact in saving a lot of patients' lives because of the fact that they are now new markers of risk. Again, demonstrating here the opportunity with MRI to see in the muscle, really, with gadolinium contrast, which is taken up into the heart muscle and HCM. And these arrows are pointing to where contrast with gadolinium can reside in a patient with HCM and demonstrates fibrosis and scarring of the heart muscle. Um, and the scar that you can see with the MRI has been linked to an increased risk of sudden death as well. The more you have of scarring by MRI, the greater that risk is of a sudden death event. And so that's why we use the MRI today to help again, inform about risk stratification. And that's why it is one of the new markers that can help decide about ICD as well. And, and, and this is just, just, just to show you, this is just to demonstrate that 
if you apply that strategy that I just showed you to a large group of patients with HCM, it does very well in, in identifying those that are at the greatest risk in the future of a sudden death event. Um, what we call sensitivity of 95%. That just means a very high likelihood that if you use those markers and you put in an ICD in those patients, um, that, that, that those will in fact be patients in whom the ICD eventually goes off and discharges for what would have been a potentially life-threatening arrhythmia. And the specificities of 78% just means that by protecting all those lives that are at risk, you know, we're not perfect in this strategy. And so there will be some over-treatment. So there will be devices that will go in because of that, that will not fire um, the lifetime of the patient. So they were put in and didn't actually deliver any treatment. So there is some, some slight degree of over-treatment at the, at the benefit of protecting as many patients, patients as possible. And the downside of, of you know, the, 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 the ICD, as many, you know, as you can appreciate in this crowd, are, are, are related to the fact that these devices um, can increase risk of a number of complications. Um, transvenous devices have increased risk of infection, vascular complications, and lead failure. Uh, the first issue is inappropriate shocks, but I, over the last decade, the risk of that has gone down, actually because of advances in the technology with programming. And so the risk for an HM patient to have an inappropriate shock, that the ICD shocking you for a rhythm that it shouldn't, is low at about 2% per year, but still an important issue. Lead complications have also decreased because of the improvement in the lead technology and the transvenous devices, but also because we have the opportunity now to implant patients with you know, so-called leadless devices called subcutaneous devices, which at least the lead doesn't go in the vein or the heart and therefore not subjected to complications of the vasculature or lead breakage and can be removed very easily without risk. And that, that risk is about 1% per year. Um, so low again, real but low. And then there's the issue of, of the impact of these devices on quality of life. And the, the studies that have looked at the impact of ICDs on the quality of life of ACM patients have been kind of mixed, but there, there really is no clear evidence that, ha, that, that the ICD, even in young ACM patients, causes psychological impairment um, or any impact on the general well being necessarily. In fact, there are instances of, of evidence to say that having a device um, in some patients is actually a beneficial psychologically because patients feel protected, reassured. Um, they get actually benefit knowing that they have a device to protect them. Not all, some obviously are significantly impacted um, and it's a very very big challenge for them, um, but there are others where that's not the case. And so quality of life is an important issue, but variable uh, in terms of individual patients and how they, uh, uh, how they feel about that. And I'll just finish by, you know, again, demonstrating here that the way that we do this is we assess individual patients for these markers some of them are history, some of them are imaging results, as we just showed you, um, incorporating physician judgment to make it with a shared decision-making strategy, a decision for an individual patient about the need for ICD to protect them against sun death. And I'll just demonstrate here the, the, you know, a really important point that, you know, that this sudden death strategy that I just showed you with the ICD and a lot of the other contemporary treatments that we talked about today, surgery, ablation, anticoagulation, afib ablations, all of that applied to HCM has been responsible for decreasing disease mortality to a 0.5% per year risk today in the current contemporary era, which is low. We need to do better, of course, um, but it is much lower, much lower than in prior treatment eras. So we've made an enormous amount of progress in this disease with a lot of the treatments you've heard about today to both ensure normal longevity and a good quality of life for the vast majority of patients, not all, but for the vast majority. And we've got still work to do as we heard today, but we've come a long way. And let me just end there because I don't want to, it's late in the night um, and we'll just stop there um, in terms of my portion and open it up to questions. Marty, you get a gold star for patients. 
and focus tonight. So bravo to you for that one. Thank you. Thank you. We saw a new it. side of Dr. Marin tonight. Daddy Marin um, trying to manage. How old is, how old is Bodie? Three? Three and a half. Yep. Three and a half. Yep. So bravo yeah. there. Thanks. Okay. So um, yeah, I uh, you get points for that one. So I'm going to have yeah. you stop sharing your screen. Actually, I think I can have you stop sharing your screen from okay. over here. Uh, got it. Got it. Yep. I got it. Okay. You got your hands full. We got we got the screen share stuff. Okay, we do have a couple of questions coming in, and I am going to um, sure. suggest that all, all hands on deck here tonight. Um, if you have an MD after your name, feel free to answer a question. Um, and we're going to kind of jump around here a little bit. I'll start with how often should somebody get an MRI? Okay, I'll, I'll, I'll handle that. So it's a good question. I think that he, here's the deal. I think that MRI um, should probably be incorporated into the initial evaluation of almost all patients, okay? And then for those that, you know, don't have a device, it would be reasonable to consider repeating it probably at about every three to five years, somewhere in that range. There's no clear direction about that yet because we don't really have the data to tell us exactly, but I think expert opinion would be every three to five years to help and kind of reinform about scarring at that interval. I think every year or every two years is too soon. Okay. Um, and this one was not covered this evening, um, but this is a really good question. Is HOCM, so HCM with obstruction, with Noonan's syndrome managed the same way as HCM with obstruction in a non-Noonan's case? Who wants to jump uh, in? Could, I'll jump in there. Um, um, I'll jump in there. So here's the answer to that. And, and that's a good question because obstruction, whether it can be present in other diseases besides HCM as, as, the, as the question was alluding to. So you can have obstruction in Noonan's, you can have obstruction in other diseases like amyloid that look like HCM, Dannon, you know, other, these other diseases of thick hearts can also have obstruction. And regardless of the, of the of whatever disease the obstruction is present in, if it we, if there's judgment that the obstruction is causing symptoms that can't be relieved with medicines, then we do the same treatment strategy that we do with obstructive HCM. We operate primarily operate in those situations, do a myectomy to relieve the obstruction, to restore the pressures to normal. Okay, and that is effective at making patients feel better whether they have Noonan's, amyloid, or OHCM. Good answer, thank you very much. Is there a relationship between non-obstructive heart failure and pulmonary hypertension? Additional question, is monitoring BNP appropriate to measure severity? You're up, Ethan. Um, so the answer is yes. So patients with non-obstructive HCM who are developing worse heart failure symptoms, they tend to have elevated pressures in the atrium, which can back up into the lungs. And so they can develop pulmonary hypertension with non-obstructive HCM. Um, that's something that needs to be monitored for um, and specifically because that can end up being a problem if you're developing severe symptoms and looking at a heart transplant. If pulmonary hypertension becomes severe, then the new heart might not be able to tolerate those pressures. So it's something we need to closely monitor <clears throat> and be aggressive with in non-obstructive HCM with progressive symptoms. <clears throat> In general, to answer on a separate note, to answer the question about BNP monitoring in HCM, um, 
BNP is frequently elevated in HCM patients, is nonspecific. So in general, an elevated BNP is not the same as an elevated BNP in the general population. Um, so much less utility in terms of monitoring BNP and HCM. Okay. So if somebody does monitor their BNP and they see that it's gone from maybe two, 300 up to three or 4,000, that would be a remarkable change in BNP and that needs attention. But if they're monitoring it and it's the three or 400 as they're normal and they pop to four or 500, that doesn't have the same level of importance, correct? Correct. Okay. All right, so we answered that question. We got a couple more coming in here. Um, I'm going to let Marty run away for a bit, but there is a question for Marty, so we'll bring him back when Bodhi allows him. Um, if multiple repetitive NSVT is the only marker present, and we're not given a rate or a frequency, what frequency of these events is events contrude to a, a, the need for an ICD? Um, constitutes, I'm sorry, I'm like looking at this word and I have my glasses on. Um, so what is the rate, what is the repetitiveness required to use NSVT as a risk marker for sudden death? So, yeah, so the, here, here's the answer to, to that is that um, the, there is no precise cutoff for which an exact rate or an exact burden or an exact length of NSVT automatically constitutes a risk factor for which an ICD would be recommended. Okay? We don't have that kind of precision, okay? But what we do have is data to suggest that, that greater weight can be given to NSVT as a risk marker and therefore a decision for ICD if that NSVT on the monitor is, is multiple, so multiple runs, more than three different runs, perhaps over a relatively short period of time, or a run that is particularly, uh, a burst that is particularly fast, like over 180 beats per minute, or one that's long, greater than 10 beats in a row, okay? If you see that, that's where this idea that I talked about of judgment, you know, reasoning and judgment and, and, and having to put um, your kind of your cap on in terms of putting greater weight on that rather than, for example, one single four beat run that's slow, okay, like 130 beats a minute. So that, that, that in a, you know, in a 10,000 foot perspective, that's kind of how we approach NSVT on the monitor, okay? There's judgment involved bottom line, but greater weight to frequency, speed, and length. Okay, so let's stay on the ICD risk factors. If you are over 60 years old, what risk factors would indicate that you do need an ICD? So again, that's a scenario where and I think the message here is, is that, you know, we've got it, you, you know, when you're talking about risk stratification and the strategy that I talked about in ICD, it's very much individualized. Every individual patient has to be taken into consideration in terms of their own specific clinical profile. But to answer the question in general terms, if you're over 60, you know, the bar for putting in a device for primary prevention for sudden death is much higher than it is in younger or middle-aged patients. Why? Because the studies that have looked at patients like that have shown that the sudden death risk or rate is very, very low once you achieve age 60 and beyond. Does that mean it's zero? No. So the answer to the question of who then gets an ICD depends a little bit on what that per over person over 60, patient over 60's risk factor may be, how concerning it is, um, the circumstances of it, the weight that we're gonna be putting on it, you know, et cetera. So it, 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 I, there's no one, one answer, it would depend. Uh, for example, if there's a 63 year old patient and they have a really concerning episode 
of syncope that by all characteristics is ominous and concerning, then you know there's the possibility that that could result in an ICD. Okay, so I think you know that's that's the that's kind of how we think about that situation. Okay, um, so we're gonna kind of do a potpourri now. Um, two questions from one. Um, actually, this is one of our discussion group leaders. Are Fitbit and Apple Watches safe for patients with ICDs to wear? Yes, we all agree. Yes, safe. Yes, there's yeah. there's concern over the um, the most recent generation of the iPhone um, and ICDs, and that's specifically when you put the i uh, the iPhone in your shirt pocket right over the ICD. Uh, but Apple Watches, um, Fitbits, et cetera, have never been shown to interfere with the ICD signal. Yes, cell phones in your shirt pocket or ladies under the bra, we all have done that for a moment here and there. Bad idea because it can interfere, so don't do that. Um, okay, statistics here. We're gonna talk about a little bit of uh, myectomy. How many myectomies, is there current data on the number of patients who've undergone septal myectomy who end up needing a second or other surgical procedures later in life. I'm, I'm assuming focused on obstruction. What percentage of post myectomy patients end up with ICDs? And how many still have some degree of mitral regurg? Mike, you've been quiet. We'll tap you for some of these. Thanks, Lisa. Um, you know, a vast majority of patients do not need an additional myectomy. Um, rarely patients need cardiac surgery for other reasons. Um, they develop coronary artery disease and need a bypass. They need a valve replacement or repair. It comes up and can be done safely, uh, but, it, but it's um, unusual. Um, the number of patients that, that have some degree of mitral valve regurgitation, uh, our, our goal and our, our literature suggests that um, you want to have less than moderate mitral regurgitation leaving the operating room. And so uh, certainly if people have trace or mild mitral regurgitation after heart surgery or after mitral valve repair, um, that's generally well tolerated and the data suggests that that doesn't impact long-term outcomes. Um, so we certainly strive to have minimal to no mitral regurgitation, but it, sometimes people have a little bit coming out of the operating room. Okay, so I think there was a follow-up one on that. So what percentage, so total percentage of those with HCM who need an ICD, are we, Marty, Ethan, everybody jump in here. 20, 25% of HCM patients need devices. That's about the right number. Yes. Yeah, I think it, de it depends on kind of what, what, you know, what group is looking at it because you know, certain groups are seeing being referred, for example, the higher risk patients just because they're a major referral center and you know, that they, they, their, their rates could be high, a little higher than other centers that may not be seeing quite as many high risk, sicker patients. But yeah, it's somewhere between 10 to 20%. That's the bottom line. 10 to 20, okay. Um, okay, I think we answered all of Deborah's questions. So thank you for those great questions. Um, that's next. Is there any damage that comes from an inappropriate or non-therapeutic shock from an ICD? Yeah, it's a good question. And that's one of the things we always talk about, obviously, because that's a obvious question you know, concern for patients. And, and the answer is that there's no damage that's done for an inappropriate shock in terms of impacting the structure of the heart or anything else. So we don't, we don't, we, there's no evidence for that. So it's, it's not about damage, it's, it's really just not really, it is about the psychological impact that that can have a shock, um, appropriate or inappropriate uh, uh, for certain patients that that, that can be very difficult to, 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 to deal with and, and understandably. So that's really what the, the impact of, of, of the inappropriate shock is mostly about in terms of the adversity of it. Okay. So I, I do know a number of patients who do have some PTSD 
post appropriate shocks and inappropriate shocks. So right. while life with the device sounds to some reassuring and to others scary, it's not without its own consequences. I loved my device. I was friends with it. I felt a little odd leaving the hospital with my new heart and no ICD. I, I, I'm like, don't, don't I need one? And I didn't. So, you know, you get used to leaning on it. But for some, it can invoke a lot of stress and anxiety. And these are things that need to be discussed and you need to have a strategy to deal with that as well. It's actually a common topic that we talk about in discussion groups just among patients. Okay. Um, how many ICDs appropriately do discharge over a patient's life or statistically speaking? Discharge rate of device. Yeah, it's, it's about, you know, statistically speaking, it's about 4% per year appropriate. So if you take a, in other words, if you take a whole group of patients with HCM that have had an ICD implanted because of one or more of those risk markers and you follow them, the rate of discharge for appropriate rhythms that it should shock you for is about 4% per year, essentially. And that's held pretty steady for 10, 15 years now, if, if my memory serves me correctly. Yeah, I mean, exactly. And it's been about the same, whether it's been looked at in populations of HCM patients in the US or Europe or Asia, it comes out to be about the same, 4% per year appropriate device shock for, for VT or VF. That's right. Okay. Yep. I think that's, that's proving the test of time. Can somebody with an ICD participate in moderate physical activity, including downhill skiing? Well, I think the, the, the principle there is that, you know, because you have a device, the way we look at it doesn't mean that you can then engage in physical activities that we would have restricted or suggested the patient be restricted from if they didn't have a device. Because the idea is that, you know, we don't want HCM patients with devices doing things physically that would then increase the chance of a life-threatening rhythm and the device going off. Okay, we don't, we're not interested in that. Obviously patients, most of them are not as well. And so there are still restrictions on, on physical activity, certain physical activity limits because of that, okay? And without getting into the details about whether skiing or what type of skiing you know, would constitute that, the bottom line is that that's a discussion that you, would, you, know, you should have with your cardiologist about where those limits lie for you if you have a device, but there are limits. And I think that was a good question for another reason, and that is to discuss how you participate in a particular activity. You know, you're doing a black diamond and you lose consciousness or you get dizzy. There are risks associated with that. If you're doing an intermediate hill or a beginner hill, there's less risk there, but there's still risk. So I think these are conversations and this is where some shared decision-making makes sense. You know, right. if you're dealing with a child, there's a whole different set of rules and a parent's making decisions for a child with a doctor. There's a lot of people involved in that decision. If you're an adult and you're speaking to your physician about what you want for your life, those are different types of decisions. So I think that's important uh, to think about. When an ICD, I, I think I figured out who the person is who is deb debating about a device just by the questions and the number of them. Um, when an ICD correctly delivers therapy, what percent of time does it successfully end a sudden cardiac arrest? Yeah, there, it's about as high as we can get. I mean, you know, for the most part, you're looking at, you know, appropriate elimination of a life-threatening rhythm by a device of 98, 99%, you know, I mean, um, there are just case reports of that not being the case in HCM. Um, and so that it's relegated to that case, very rare case report. Otherwise, we look at it as 99% effective. Okay, so we're gonna have to stay on this device question. And I, and I think we're gonna, this, this is a confusing factor. So we have to lay this out a little bit. Risk per year of all cause death. And I'm gonna add to your question, Ryan, 
in a high volume HCM specialty care program is 0.5%. But what percentage of all HCM patients die from the disease experience or have disability uh, experience debilitating symptoms? Um, so let's start, start there. So I'm, I'm gonna set this up a little bit differently, Ryan. I know what you're getting at. So if only 0.5% die, why do anything about it? And what's the chance of it getting worse? That 0.5 number comes from a very specific data set of patients who were treated and evaluated in a high volume care center. And that 0.5% survival includes people like me who've had a heart transplant, people who've had experienced sudden cardiac arrest, which was aborted by an ICD. This is not saying that they didn't have any problems. This is how many people survived. Marty, would that be an appropriate explanation of the 0.5%? Yeah, I mean, I, th I, th I think so. I mean, it, yeah, the 0.5% is the risk in a, in, in a, in a, today for an HCM patient of mortality, okay, of death due to HCM, 0.5% per year, okay? It's about 0.2 for sudden death and 0 0.3, 0 0.4% for heart failure, okay? So that's the risk. So if a patient, HCM patient asks, what's my risk being treated in an expert HCM center of dying from the disease? It's, that's what it is. It's 0.5% per year, okay? That's the general HCM population's risk being treated in an, at an expert center today. Do we really know what the risks are when treated at a community level hospital or by a non HCM expert? No, we just don't have that. You know, we just don't have what's called non referral data in this disease, just because it's just been very difficult to, to, to accumulate or assemble that kind of information. So we don't know the answer to that. Okay. All right, Ryan, I hope that answers your questions. Um, so we're going to go to what is the meaning as SVT in HCM? Do we, what is the meaning? Is there a meaning? Let's define okay. SVT for those who don't know what it is. And then is it a risk? Is there something risky about SVT in HCM? So SVT is supraventricular tachycardia, which is any heartbeat that starts from above the ventricle and is fast. Um, so that being said, a normal fast heart rhythm when someone is running can be an SVT. Um, we don't really think about that, um, but SVT also includes atrial fibrillation. Um, so it's kind of a big encompassing term. So the question becomes what is the actual SVT for that person. Um, and that really guides treatment and level of concern um, with some SVTs being concerning like atrial fibrillation or flutter where we need specific treatment and others um, being less common and less associated with the disease and having a completely different treatment pathway. Okay. So I think that answered that question. Um, somebody asked, is the summit still available for viewing? And the answer is yes. Um, I put the address to hcmsummit.com in the chat and you can go there and you can still purchase um, access to the summit. You're just not watching it live, obviously, because we already did it. Um, but you can watch it for what's another four months, Marty? Yeah, uh, yeah, exa yeah, exactly. That's right. Okay. So you can watch it for another four months. And if you're looking for CME credits, that's another 30 days, right? Or about that? That's right. Okay. So see, I was listening to Emily all those times. We went over all this stuff. Um, don't, you never want to not listen to Emily on, on the summit stuff. She, she's, she's got that game down. Okay. Um, myectomy question. Mike, hit that on mute button. Myectomy, myectomy recommended... First one was done 15 years ago at five. Um, I'm thinking this might be a Noonan's one. 
Um, scared to do another one because it was rocky for a little while. So there are differences between operating on a little five-year-old heart and a 20-year-old heart, even in Noonan's with a small body stat stature. Um, what are the risks um, with my second myectomy 15 years later? That's a great question. And Lisa, I think you're exactly right. Not, not only is it different operating on a 20-year-old than it is a five-year-old, but the techniques and the technologies have, have improved over the past 15 years. And so, you know, not, it's, it's definitely better than it's going to be. It was the first time. Um, the risks are, are there, but they're, they're pretty reasonable. For the most part nowadays, doing a reoperative uh, surgery of this type very similar risks to the first time. And um, uh, if it's done with an expert surgeon, then you know, you're likely to have a good outcome with this. I would definitely go to a high volume center for a second myectomy. When you're going in that chest the second time, there are additional risks. Um, adhesions, just the, the, the chest has already been open. There's already been a sternotomy. So you want to make sure that you have the highest level of care possible in those situations. Would you agree? I would certainly agree with that, Lisa, 100%. Okay. You're, you're always allowed not to agree with me, but not when I'm right. <laughs> okay. Um, okay, we answered that question. Um, does where the thickening in the ventricle happen determine the side effects from myectomy? I think, I think that's a really good question. And, and there's a lot of issues that come up with that. Uh, and the answer is yes. Um, mainly for most folks, it's gonna be around where the uh, conduction system is and, and what the risk of pacemaker will be after the operation. Um, but, in, in more rare cases, the mid cavity and the apical. So the, if the thickening is not at the base of the heart, but is in the middle of the left ventricle or out at the apex, that, that changes the approach to the operation and changes the risks as well. Um, but on the whole, most people have what we call the basilar at the base of the heart, the, the heart is thickened and um, and so the risks are, um, are pretty reasonable. Okay, so we're gonna talk about genetics and after we're done with this question, we're going to end the, the Facebook feed and we will stay here for another minute or two after that. So if anybody has any questions, they do not want recorded to live in perpetuity on Facebook and on YouTube, et cetera. They can ask those questions in just a minute. Um, so during the summit, there were some discussions about HCM genetics and the yield, which we once thought was 40 to 50 percent is 35 to 45 percent or rough numbers there. Um, and then there was a thought that there could be other forms of HCM that have other triggers. Um, can you guys just discuss for a little bit about what we know about the root cause of HCM from non-sarcomeric or non-already identified pathogenic mutations, what are some of the other suspects at this time? Nobody wants to jump up and answer genetics questions. <laughs> Ethan, you want me to do it? Is that, you wanna? Ethan's on mute, so it's you, Marty. You and can take them, Marty, unless you want me to. It's a, it's a good one. It's a great question. And, and it, it, it's, it's, it, it goes right to a lot of the kind of cutting edge questions that are being asked right now uh, among the experts, both clinical and, and science scientists in this, in, that, are, that are focused on this disease. And, that, and that's because I think we, we finally come to realize that, you know, that we've sequenced all the gene, genes here and, 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 and you're still left with 60 to 70 percent of patients with HCM that have no identifiable mutation, 60 to 70%. Kind of begs the question then, you know, first, is this really a genetic disease then? And I think we're, we're trying to 
and also on, on, on that note, I mean, there are a lot of patients that have a, a known pathogenic mutation that never express the disease. So there are all kinds of questions now that have been raised about, as you said, what is responsible for HCM? What's the cause? We talked a lot about that at the summit, and we don't know the answer to that right now, but you know what, what is sort of being advanced right now is that it's possible that there may be a situation where there are a number of different kind of what we call polygenic, a number of different var genetic variants. So not one mutation, but number of different kind of genetic changes in a patient who then potentially as well gets subjected to certain triggers for which we don't know the answer to right now. We don't know what those are, but there's a possibility that environmental factors could be triggers or help in some way to facilitate disease expression along with being at risk because of these other genetic markers, not a single mutation, but just a number of different variants that could result in a, in a disease that at the end of the day looks very similar to or identical to and is HCM, but isn't due to a known sarcomere mutation, okay? So the answer to the question is we don't know yet. We think it could be a combination of environment. We don't know what those triggers could be, plus a variety of different genetic susceptibility markers that along with the triggers come together to result in a common looking disease, HCM. That, that's a kind of a short, you know, 10,000 foot answer to that question. So the answer is, we don't know all the reasons why the heart does what it does and looks like HCM. And because right. we don't know all of the reasons we all have to start thinking about things differently or continue to think about things from a very curious point of view. Why is it doing this? Is it stress? Is it hypertension? Is it genetic modifiers as we once thought they might be? Um, or is it all of the above and different for different people? I think is probably going to be more the answer. For, 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 for people out there, just to think about it this way too, you know, We've long known that dilated cardiomyopathy, right? So big heart because the, the cavity is big, but the walls are thin. So dilated cardiomyopathy can be caused by genetic mutations and can also be caused by patients that don't have the genetic mutations that have other triggers. For example, alcohol use can cause dilated cardiomyopathy. Viral infections can do it. There's a number of different reasons that can result in a common disease like dilated cardiomyopathy, They're not related to a mutation. And that may end up being the case in HCM. And that's really what we're saying. There may be different ways to get to the same top of the mountain. I think it's kind of an exciting time in HCM. <laughs> and I, I've been doing this for a long time. And we finally are seeing some things kind of shifting in ways that I think are quite meaningful to underlying etiology, to new mechanisms that are being targeted for drug therapy, to better understanding of who should get an ICD and when, to refining criteria for septal reduction therapy, opening options for patients there. Our toolbox is getting a little fuller, don't you think? Yeah, there's no question. I think we're, we're, we're that that we all would agree with that that they we're entering into a different, you know, landscape in, in a lot of different ways for HCM. How we think about etiology, how we may treat certain aspects of the disease, and that's all really good. I think the important point there is not to, when we do that, forget where we came from either our roots in terms of treatments that we've got right now that can be really effective. So I think as we move forward, we've got to also keep things in balance in terms of also remembering how important a lot of these other therapies are before too quickly dismissing them in a way as well. So I agree. 
So yeah, I so really I agree. It's, a, it's an exciting time. There's no question. Okay, so I'm going to say goodbye to people on Facebook. And we have a couple of other questions here. So people on Facebook, thank you for joining us. And we are...